Justice Jackson? So when I asked you earlier about the uniformity concern um, and the troubling potential disuniformity of having different states enforce Section 3 with respect to presidential elections, you seem to um, point to history in a certain way. You said, I think, that the framers actually envisioned states enforcing Section 3. Um, uh, at least in some circumstances where there were insurgents and Confederates. And I guess in my view of the history, I'm wondering really whether presidential elections were such a circumstance, that the framers um, actually envisioned states enforcing Section 3 with respect to presidential elections as opposed to senatorial elections, representatives, the sort of more local concerns. So can you speak to the argument that really Section 3 was about preventing the South from rising again in the context of these sort of local elections as opposed to focusing on the presidency? Well, two points on that, Justice Jackson. First is that, as I discussed earlier, there isn't the same history of states regulating ballot access at this time. So ballot access rules to ex restrict presidential candidates wouldn't have wouldn't have existed. They wouldn't have been raised one way or another. Right, but I'm not uh, making a distinction between but, ballot access and no, anything uh, else. Understood. Yeah. But the more yeah. the more broad point I want to make is that what is very clear from the history is is that the framers were concerned about charismatic rebels who might rise through the ranks up to and including the presidency of the United States. But then why didn't they put the word president in the very enumerated list in Section Three? The thing that really is troubling to me is I totally understand your argument, but they were listing people that were barred, and president is not there. And so I guess that just makes me worry that maybe they weren't focusing on the president and, for example, the fact that electors of vice president and president are there suggests that really what they thought was if we're worried about the charismatic person, we're going to bar insurrectionist electors, and therefore that person is never going to rise. This came up in the debates in Congress over Section 3, where uh, Reverdy Johnson said, why haven't you included pre president and vice president in the language? And Senator Morrill responds, we have. Look at the language, any office under the United States. Yes, but doesn't that at least suggest ambiguity? And this sort of ties into Justice Kavanaugh's point. In other words, we had a, a person right there at the time saying what I'm saying. The, the language here doesn't seem to include president. Why is that? And so if there's an ambiguity, why would we construe it to, as Justice Kavanaugh pointed out, uh, uh, against democracy? Well, Reverdy Johnson came back and agreed with that reading. Any office is clear. The Constitution says about 20 times. No, that I don't, I'm not going to that. So let me, let me, let me just say, you, so your point is that, it's, that there's no ambiguity. It, with, with, with having a list and not having president in it, with having a history that suggests that they were really focused on local concerns in the South, um, with this conversation where the legislators actually discussed what looked like an ambiguity, you're saying there is no amb uh, ambiguity in Section 3? Let me take the point specifically about electors and senators, if I might, because I think that's yes. important. Presidential electors were not covered because they don't hold an office. They vote. Uh, and this no, I'm talking about the barred office part of it, this. Exactly. So the right? barred office is, if you want to ex include everybody, first you have to specify presidential electors because they're not offices, so they wouldn't fall under any office. Second of all, senators and representatives don't hold office either. The Constitution tells us that under the incompatibility clause and refers to them as holding seats, not offices. And so you want to make sure that there's no doubt that senators and representatives are covered, given that the Constitution suggests otherwise, you have to include them. The Constitution says the presidency holds an office, as do members of this court. And so other high offices, the president, vice president, members of this court. All right, let me, let me ask you, I, I appreciate that argument. Um, if we think that the states can't enforce this provision for whatever reason in this context, in the presidential context, what happens next in this case? I mean, are, are, is it done? If this court concludes that Colorado did not have the authority to exclude President Trump from the presidential ballot on procedural grounds, I think, I think this case would be done. But 
I think it could come back with a vengeance because ultimately members of Congress w may have to make the, dis the determination after a presidential election if President Trump wins about whether or not he's disqualified from office and whether to count votes cast for him under the Electoral Count Reform Act. So uh, President Trump himself urges this court in the first few pages of his brief to resolve the issues on the merits, and we think that the court should do so as well. And there's no federal lit uh, litigation, you would say? Well, that's correct, because there is no federal procedure for deciding these issues, short of a criminal prosecution. Thank you.